still like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, wel welcome back to uh, day two of the uh, short course here. Uh, today, or the first thing this morning, I want to uh, talk about sound transmission, <coughs> mostly uh, having to do with sound transmission through barriers, which are, of course, a common noise control feature. Um, the advertised title of this talk also includes absorption, uh, so uh, the absorption of sound when sound hits walls or floors or ceiling. Um, to be honest, I will talk about that perhaps a little bit tomorrow when we're doing the materials uh, lecture in the morning. Uh, so this morning I'd like to concentrate on barriers and walls uh, and ways of predicting their performance. Uh, ways of quantifying the performance, what people do in terms of ranking walls, <coughs> and then a little bit uh, towards the end about uh, some potential problems with walls when things uh, don't go quite right. So, so let's get going here. So uh, what I'm talking about here are walls that are separating one room from another or barriers uh, that are enclosing a source or whatever the you can or uh, a classic example that I've done some work with is aircraft fuselage structures. Uh, you can think of ship hulls uh, perhaps as being along these lines as well. But uh, in any event, we have uh, a sound coming in to hit a wall. Uh, and of course, some fraction of the sound is reflected and heads back towards where it was coming from. Uh, and then some is transmitted through the wall, and some is dissipated, right? Uh, I perhaps, uh, so it's very common to say that sound transmits through walls. Uh, I myself have a little bit of trouble with this word because it seems to suggest that something actually penetrates the wall, whereas, of course, what uh, happens uh, is that the incident wave generates wave motion in the wall that then radiates sound from the back side, right? So it, it's maybe a mistake to think that anything actually goes through the wall as opposed to the wall moving and then radiating sound from the back. The, uh, also, you'll see that there's some sound energy dissipated in the, uh, in the wall. That's normally not so, uh, not so big, but uh, should not be neglected. So the, th the thing that we conventionally use to uh, quantify the performance of the wall is, first of all, the transmission coefficient, and then uh, we'll talk about the transmission loss. The transmission coefficient is, is simple. It's just the fraction of the energy that's transmitted through the structure to the energy that's incident on the, on the structure. So the ratio of transmitted normal intensity to the incident normal intensity. And remember, the intensity is the power of flux approaching or traveling through the air. So that um, if you had a perfect barrier, the transmission coefficient would be 0. If there was no barrier at all, the transmission coefficient would be 1. Right? So, But uh, as I mentioned yesterday, acoustics people have a mania for uh, turning everything into decibels. So. Uh, the same is true here, <coughs> where the transmission loss is 10 log 1 over the power transmission coefficient tau. And of course, the significance of the 1 over a tau is that if the transmission coefficient is small, which presumably is desirable, then the transmission loss is a large number, whereas if the, if the uh, transmission coefficient is large, that is approaching 1, uh, then the transmission loss is small, right? So a transmission loss of zero corresponds to a transmission coefficient of one, uh, whereas a transmission coefficient of zero would correspond to a transmission loss of, see if you're awake this morning, would be a transmission loss of, of, Sorry, <laughs> okay. So if the transmission coefficient was zero, what would the transmission loss be? In infinite, right? 
So, uh, so the transmission loss can range from zero to infinity. <coughs> As I'm saying here, the transmission loss may be of about 35 decibels. Maybe that's something that's kind of normal. Um, that corresponds to a transmission coefficient, as you'll see there, of 0 0.00032. Uh, and I think you'll agree maybe that dealing with transmission loss is a little bit more convenient than with the transmission coefficient. <coughs> also, the little note here uh, indicating that the you know, transmission coefficient of 0.032% actually seems like it's maybe pretty good, but uh, trans that corresponds to this transmission loss of 35 decibels, which in the grand scheme of things is not actually a very impressive number. So we might be looking more for things like 50 or da 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 da, -da. So the transmission coefficients uh, we're looking for are generally pretty small. OK, so a uh, little schematic here of a wave, plane wave system approaching the panel. Uh, you'll note the uh, distance between the peaks and the wave fronts approaching the panel is the wavelength. Uh, the Waves are coming in at an angle of incidence theta with respect to the normal. And then schematically here, they are driving a wave in the panel. So flexural motion of the panel, transverse back and forth. Uh, yesterday, uh, both Professor Mahanti and I made the point that in a linear system, if you drive it at a particular frequency, if you drive the system at a particular frequency, the system responds at that frequency, right? This is a forced vibration thing. So that's a temporal situation, right? I might lower this. So uh, that's a, a temporal uh, situation where you're forcing uh, a system at a particular frequency. This uh, is, let's say, the kind of spatial analog of that. The uh, incoming wave uh, creates a pressure disturbance across the panel that has uh, that repeats itself in what is called the trace wavelength, which is the distance between points of the same phase on the incident wave front. Uh, and that distance is this lambda divided by sine theta, right? So when uh, theta is equal to pi by 2 and the wave fronts are coming in parallel with the panel, uh, then the wavelength and the trace wavelength are the same, but the trace wavelength gets longer and longer as you move towards normal incidence and hold that thought. So you're driving bending waves along the panel. Uh, they, in turn, are radiating out the back. And when you do uh, the calculations of for the transmission coefficient, substitute in boundary conditions and things, what you end up with is an expression like this. Tau theta is equal to this group of stuff here, plus, you know, these are technical terms, another group of stuff here. Uh, something I would like you to note, eta is the plate loss factor, which is, uh, for metal, a very small number, right? So that might be 0 0.001 or 0 0.003 or something, uh, something like that. So this uh, term represents dissipative losses due to flexing in the panel. It's generally pretty small, so if you could forget that that is there for the moment, that would be good. Uh, down in this uh, term, uh, you'll see that there's a mass per unit area, which is the rho sub s, so this would be 2 kilograms per square meter or something, uh, divided by the characteristic impedance of the air, and of course this cosine theta here. Uh, then B is uh, the f bending stiffness or the flexural stiffness of the panel, so the resistance to flexing. Uh, as the panel moves uh, back and forth. <coughs> so the stiffer the panel, the larger the B is. And something to note here in particular is the fact that there is this minus sign here. So when you multiply this thing out, you get a positive term and you get a negative term. 
Uh, so there's the potential that those things uh, can cancel with each other, right? And in particular, if they do cancel, so if this second term disappears, and if this eta is small, what do we have left here, right? So the transmission coefficient uh, can conceivably go to one at some point due to the cancellation of these two terms here, and that happens at something called the coincidence frequency, and we will talk more about that to um, a little bit later. But this term is essentially proportional to mass. This one is proportional to stiffness. You'll note that the stiffness term here is proportional to omega squared, so it's a parabolic function going up with frequency. This is a linear function of frequency, and at very at low frequencies, the linear function tends to be more significant than the parabolic function going up. So if you do just a little bit of math, you can show that at lower frequencies, below this thing called the critical frequency or the coincidence frequency, the transmission loss is simply 10 log of this 1 plus omega rho s over 2 rho naught c uh, cosine theta. Okay, uh, And this is uh, the, the, the region uh, which we refer to as the mass law which is uh, a very sort of famous result in noise control. Uh, and um, I'm, a, I'm afraid sometimes I'm guilty of uh, uh, telling people that the definition to me of, mecha of mechanical engineering is hit it with a bigger hammer, right? So more is better, right, is uh, the m message of mechanical engineering. And this is an example of that because it is indicating that if you increase the mass per unit area, the, the transmission loss increases, right? And so that's the very simple message out of this, that if you want good barrier performance, you need a relatively heavy barrier, right? And it will turn out that uh, something like lead, for example, is a great uh, barrier material and, and for reasons that we'll explain a little bit later. So as far as this goes, mass is good, the, since only the mass of the panel is important. So the, uh, and again, if you do the, do the math here, you'll see that if you double the mass per unit area, if you go from one kilogram per square meter to two, uh, then the transmission loss goes up by six decibels. And so each time you double the mass per unit area, you're getting a six decibel increase uh, in the transmission loss. Uh, but we should also note that the same thing is true of frequency here. The fact that they're showing up in this pair like this, omega rho s, means that the effect of frequency is exactly the same as the effect of mass, right? <coughs> so if you double the frequency, uh, you get a six decibel increase in transmission loss, just as if you were doubling the mass. So transmission loss increases with frequency, it increases with mass, and this is a particularly simple result, and it's sort of safe, uh, and so people usually try to design for this condition. Right? So if you want uh, to create a barrier that has a certain transmission loss, uh, the safest thing to do is to use a formula like this to try to uh, come up with what the mass per unit area is that would be required to satisfy some criterion. The other thing to note here, uh, maybe in passing, this will maybe seem a little bit strange, but um, where, do, where does cosine go to zero? At pi by two, right? Uh, so if we move back a little bit here. So that means when the sound waves are coming in parallel with the panel, uh, the transmission loss actually goes to zero, right? Uh, so the general, very generally speaking, the performance of a barrier is best when the sound is coming straight at the barrier. The performance of a barrier is worst when the sound is coming along, grazing along the surface. So um, whether this is precisely true or not, I don't swear, but the, uh, the story is that if you have a uh, road, uh, say, 
uh, very close to a tall building, right? Uh, the sound from the traffic hits windows at the lower floors at more or less normal incidence, but as you move up the building, uh, it approaches grazing, right? So that the uh, sound transmission performance of the windows at the top of the building, in a sense, are worse is worse than the transmission loss at the bottom of the building, <coughs> which means that it, there's this kind of anomalous uh, thing that the traffic noise penetration is more or less independent of height, right? So this is a story I'm just making up, but your challenge is to go and prove this. Maybe with uh, internoise coming up in Hong Kong, where there are lots of tall buildings and lots of roads, we might be able to put this to the test, but we'll see. Uh, so as I say, at normal incidence, uh, the um, cosine theta is 1. This is the expression for the transmission loss. Uh, in principle, um, if you have a situation where sound is coming in from all angles at once, as in a space like this, where sound is bouncing around off the walls, off the floors, off the ceiling, off the people, uh, then you need to uh, consider sound, so-called diffuse incident sound, where sound is equally likely to be coming at a barrier from all angles at once. Uh, and in that case, you can do an integral over the incidence angles to work out the angle average transmission coefficient. Uh, a simple <coughs> version of that that works pretty well is this uh, so-called random incidence mass law, uh, where the random incidence transmission loss is equal to the transmission loss at normal incidence minus uh, some quantity here. Uh, emphasizing again that the random incidence transmission loss is going to be smaller than the normal incidence transmission loss. Okay, so I've mentioned uh, coincidence on the critical angle a couple of, a couple of times. Uh, this is something that's essentially a spatial resonance, right? So if you uh, again, Professor Mahanti yesterday was talking about, uh, say, single degree of freedom systems, which if you drive them at a certain frequency, they go into resonance and you get a very large response. That's when the, uh, the driving frequency matches perfectly with the natural frequency of the system, right? You get a very large response. Uh, coincidence is something that happens when the, <coughs> excuse me, when the wavelength in the panel that is being driven by the sound field coming in is exactly equal to the wavelength that the panel would have if it were being shaken, right? So that the so-called free vibration of the panel, the free wavelength of the panel is equal to the trace wavelength of the incoming sound field that you get a perfect spatial matching between the driving force that's driving the motion of the panel and the free response that the panel would have at that frequency if it were just being driven by a force. So you're asking the panel to do exactly what it wants to do, and so the response is very enthusiastic. And under uh, certain conditions, the panel just becomes transparent at that frequency. So this is uh, typically something that happens at higher frequencies for a typical um, engineering kind of materials. For um, uh, if you <laughs> don't try this at home, I was going to say if you drill through an aircraft fuselage, <laughs> uh, you'll find that the thickness of the skin is normally something like 50, forgive me using inches here, but 50 thousandths of an inch or uh, 70 thousandths of an inch aluminum, aluminum in this part of the world, excuse me. Uh, so that's a little bit more than a millimeter, I guess, 1.2 millimeters maybe. But um, uh, the coincidence frequency for that kind of structure is around 10 kilohertz or so, right? Uh, generally speaking, the stiffer uh, something gets, the lower the uh, coincidence or critical frequency is. Uh, and so for an extreme example is um, carbon fiber composite systems. So if you have a system uh, 
with carbon fiber face sheets, honeycomb core, uh, which is sometimes used in advanced aircraft structures, uh, the cr critical frequency can be as low as 100 hertz. Right? So uh, you can co cover a broad range of things, but for uh, many of the materials that are used in autom automobiles or air aircraft, the critical frequency is pretty high, which is why we talk primarily about the mass law being the lower frequency region and the region that you want to work in. But the coincidence effect is interesting, this perfect matching of the free response of the panel <coughs> with the uh, forcing wavefront. Uh, and this happens, as I say, when the, what, sorry, this should be the trace, well, sorry, this is the critical frequency. So when the speed of sound in air, which is C, is equal to CB, which is the speed of flexural wave propagation, free flexural wave propagation uh, in the panel. Um, above the critical frequency, above FC, there's always some angle at which you can create that perfect match between the free wave speed and the uh, incoming trace wavelength. <coughs> and that is the so-called coincidence uh, condition. S and the transmission coefficient, again, if you do the sums, so way back at the beginning here, I mentioned that there are these two terms here, one positive, one negative. At coincidence, they cancel each other out, and you're only left with this stuff. Uh, so going, I can find my way back here. Uh, so at coincidence, the transmission coefficient 1 plus eta times this. And remember, eta is the loss factor for the panel, which is, for a pure metal, for example, not a large number. Uh, so this is almost negligible. The transmission coefficient almost goes to 1, and the transmission loss only goes there often, or goes close to 0. So. Uh, damping is a big benefit uh, at the critical or coincidence frequency. So if you have a problem with that, then putting a damping treatment on the structure, constraint layer damping or something, is going to be very helpful in terms of transmission loss. And maybe that reminds me of something, and maybe I will back up a little bit here. This uh, is the transmission loss in going back to the mass-controlled region, right? And I will just point out that the loss factor does not show up in this expression. So in principle, if you're in the mass-controlled region, adding damping to the structure does not do anything for you in terms of the transmission loss. So buying an expensive damping treatment uh, to put on the panel <coughs> does not do anything except add some mass, right? And it's maybe an expensive way to add mass uh, to the panel. So people who come, you know, not that I'm, not that I'm making judgments here, but uh, people who come from a vibration background often think, you know, damping's the answer. You know, damp, put damping on stuff. Uh, but uh, under uh, circumstances like this, it doesn't actually do you any good, right? So um, again, you have to be aware of what's happening uh, to be able to make appropriate decisions when it comes to uh, any kind of treatment. So um, just to summarize this little discussion, so usually we try to operate in the mass controlled region below the critical frequency you'd like to design uh, something to ensure that the frequency of interest is uh, below the critical frequency. Uh, the critical frequency you'll see up at the top of this slide is equal to the mass per unit area divided by the uh, stiffness of the panel. And so if you really want to, if you want to get the critical frequency up, uh, then <coughs> what do you have to do is increase the mass per unit area and decrease the stiffness, right? And so if you, um, and so heavy limp barrier, heavy limp panels are good barriers. Uh, and if you take a look, I mentioned earlier lead, 
right? And if you take a look at lead as a barrier, it's got a very high mass per unit area, and in fact, the flexural stiffness is very low at a given thickness. Uh, and so it's great as a barrier material because the critical frequency is very high. Uh, generally speaking, for normal materials, as you increase the thickness, the, of course, both the mass per unit area and the stiffness increase. Uh, but generally, if it's a sort of linear material, the, the stiffness increase beats the mass increase, right? <coughs> so that the critical frequency tends to go down and down and down as you make a material thicker and thicker and thicker, right, a particular material. So again, uh, something that's relatively thin but heavy and with a low flexural stiffness would be great. So the uh, sort of uh, summary of what happens with a single panel, as shown here, the transmission loss versus uh, frequency. Uh, and forgetting about the low frequency region here just for a sec, we've talked about the mass controlled region where the transmission loss goes up for six decibels each time you double the frequency. And then you go into this uh, so-called coincidence dip region, the transmission loss goes down again, and then it starts going up. And in fact, it goes up at a pretty ferocious rate that at uh, 18 decibels per octave, so it actually gets up pretty quickly. Uh, and if you know what you're doing, maybe you can take advantage of that. But uh, what's happening here at very low frequencies has to do with uh, the fact that the panel is a finite size, right? Everything we've talked about so far is implying that the, we've got an infinite panel, right? So big, big piece of something or other, which uh, from a technical point of view, for a panel to be big, it's got to be bigger than an acoustic wavelength, right? So if you're operating at 300 hertz, maybe something that's like a meter or so uh, in dimension is big, right? And so we can sort of treat that as an infinite panel. But at lower frequencies, of course, the wavelength gets longer and longer and longer, and uh, the uh, size of the panel compared to the wavelength gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So uh, if you can imagine this, if you can imagine a huge infinite sheet Right, uh, that's unsupported and somehow floating perfectly in space. So this is like science fiction here. But uh, if uh, at very low frequencies, if something comes along, it can just move the panel back and forth. And I sometimes ask uh, the, <laughs> the students, so that the zero is, what is zero hertz sound? So something that is something zero hertz sound, what is that? <laughs> but it's, yeah, so I I just say it's wind, right? So just a steady steady flow of air, right? And so if you've got this science fiction infinite panel here. Uh, with flow of air moving along, the panel just moves with the air, right? The, uh, you'd see that the, at zero hertz, the inertia of the panel is zero, so it just moves along. <coughs> Whereas, uh, at this point, if I were not tethered to a microphone here, uh, I would go to the door of the room, lean against the door, which is applying a zero hertz force, and uh, if, <laughs> if the door is properly secured, I will not fall out, right? Uh, so, uh, and the question is, why do I not fall through the door if I'm leaning against it? What, what prevents me from falling through the door? What physical property is involved in in this? If you lean against the wall, why don't you f go through it? 
Well, so it's not really mass, right? Because you're not, it's not a dynamic issue. <coughs> so mass comes into, you know, the, the impedance of a mass is always omega m, right? So the inertia at zero hertz is not significant. What is significant? It's the stiffness, right? So it's the stiffness that prevents you falling through a wall at low frequencies. It's the same with the door, right? So uh, the door to prevent me falling through has to have two things. It has to, the door itself has to have some flexural stiffness, right, to prevent it from simply bending. Uh, and then the door has to have a stiff constraint around the edge, which is provided by the hinges and the lock, right? So that is preventing me from going through the door at low frequency, at very low frequencies. And what's the transmission loss in that case, if we can bring this back to acoustics for the moment? The fact that I don't fall through the door means that the transmission loss is, is infinite, right? <laughs> right? Because the transmission coefficient is zero because I'm not falling through the door. And so the transmission loss is infinite. Right, and so the same thing happens with a window at low frequencies, which is closed and constrained around the edge. Air doesn't move through it, uh, and so the transmission loss is actually very high at low frequencies if the if the panel is in a rigid constraint, and so that's what's happening uh, in this very low frequency region, where you get an 18 decibel per octave increase uh, in uh, transmission loss as the frequency goes down, I guess, 18 decibels for each halving of the frequency. <coughs> and typically in between, uh, there is a region where the panel is starting to do modal things, vibrating in modes of various sorts, uh, where the transmission loss is generally uh, go bumping up and down and is n not so good. But at very low frequencies, you do get this enhancement of the transmission loss due to an edge constraint. Uh, so um, everything we've talked about now, or up to this point, has had to do with single panels just by themselves. So a single layer of something at very, very low frequencies, as I was illustrating here, uh, the bending stiffness of the panel and the bending stiffness and the stiffness of the constraints is important. Uh, whereas in the mid frequency range, the panel mass per unit area is important. And then at, at higher frequencies, we get this uh, coincidence effect, which is stiffness control. And so that's the basic uh, performance of a single panel. But I think. Um, some of you may know that actually if you want to produce a high performance barrier, the simple solution is to uh, employ not a single partition, but a double partition. And the reasoning behind that is um, maybe not perfectly accurate, but kind of simple in the sense that I said there in the mass region, the mass law region, if each time you double a mass per unit area, you get a six decibel increase in transmission loss, right? So let's say at 1,000 hertz, we've got a transmission loss of 30 decibels. Uh, if I double, if I go from one kilogram per square meter to two kilograms per square meter, what's, what transmission loss do I get? Plus six, so I get 36, right? So, but in Sort of in principle, this is a little bit of a stretch, but if I, instead of doubling the mass per unit area of the single panel, if I add a second panel that has a mass per unit area of one kilogram per square meter, then I get 30 decibels from this panel and 30 decibels from this panel, which gives me a total of 60 decibels, which is way better than 36, right? <coughs> so if you're going to actually make that true, uh, certain, certain things have to, have to happen. Uh, in particular, you need uh, good absorbing material uh, in between the panels. But the basic thinking of a multi-panel system is that you're trying to add up the transmission losses of the individual panels.
And that's why in high performance systems like aircraft fuselages, um, if you've ever been in a recording studio, uh, the windows separating the control room from the uh, performance space is typically uh, two or three layers of glass separated by relatively big air spaces <coughs> and so on and so forth. So you uh, high performance transmission loss systems normally involve multiple layers. Um, and so you can get pretty good performance out of a system like this, right? Then the absorbing material uh, you can imagine is something like glass fiber, right? So again, don't really try this, but they, you know, the next time you're in an aircraft, <laughs> if you if you <laughs> if you pull off the trim panel right beside you uh, there before before the cabin crew come and arrest you. Uh, you'll find that there is uh, 7.5 or so, seven, somewhere between 7 and 10 centimeters of glass fiber in the space between the fuselage and the, and the trim panel. And so the trim panel and the fuselage are forming a double panel system with this absorbing material in between. So, um, but unfortunately, all is not sweetness and light uh, with double panels. There are, there is an issue typically at lower frequencies um, when the individual panels are in the mass controlled region and the cavity depth is small. That is the space between the two panels, small compared to a wavelength. Uh, then we can get something referred to as the mass air mass resonance uh, when the masses of the two panels are reacting against the stiffness of the air trapped in between them, right? So the air is acting like a spring, uh, then you've got two masses on it, so it can do a resonance like this, uh, at which point the transmission loss can go to zero, right? And so that's something to be avoided. Uh, the frequency uh, of that effect, the mass air mass resonance, uh, basically 2 rho naught c squared divided by d. Uh, whenever in acoustics you see rho naught c squared together, that means a stiffness, right? <coughs> and the uh, rho naught c squared divided by d is the effective spring stiffness of the air in the cavity. Uh, so basically, we've got a spring stiffness here divided by a mass to give us the natural frequency of this uh, mass air mass resonance, right? So the stiffness provided by the trapped air, rho naught c squared over d. What um, do you, do you think that air is stiff? You know, nor normally we don't think of air as being very stiff, but the, uh, do you have an idea what the bulk modulus is for air? So the, the expression that I remember is gamma P naught, right? P naught being the ambient pressure, gamma the ratio of specific heats. So that's 1.4 times 10 to the fifth pascals, right, uh, for the stiffness of air which is not, of course, not comparable with metals, which are more like 10 to the ninth, but it's not zero, right? So if um, uh, the way you can convince yourself, of course, that air has some stiffness is if you, if you take a bicycle pump, right, and uh, block the end and try to compress, uh, try to pump, uh, you can, can only get so far, right, before you, uh, it becomes impossible to move. Uh, because of the stiffness of the air trapped uh, in the chamber. So the stiffness provided by the air can be reasonably significant in when you've got relatively uh, small layers, and D is small here. <coughs> so uh, above the mass air mass frequency, the transmission loss increases at 18 decibels per octave, uh, which is why one of the reasons why double panels are kind of attractive because you get into a region where the transmission loss is going up really quickly. And without going into the details here, if, um, if you have sufficient absorption in the cavity, you do get this situation where the transmission loss, the total transmission loss of the two panels, 
is about equal to the transmission loss of panel one plus the transmission loss of panel two. Um, okay, but that requires that there's enough sound absorption in the panels that the second panel does not know that the first panel is there and vice versa, right? So what that means is that the two, or what is required is that the two panels are acting independently of each other. And the way that they act independently of each other is if you've got dissipation in this space, so sound travels through the absorbing material and essentially disappears before it gets back to the first panel. So that is in two transits across the airspace when it's filled with sound absorbing material, the sound level has to be reduced by making up a number of 40 decibels or something. <coughs> and in that case, the first panel doesn't know that the second panel is there. They're acting independently, and you do get this TL1 plus TL2 uh, situation. So uh, for that good performance, you really need to decouple the panels. If you don't do that, then the conclusion is that the transmission loss uh, of a double panel system it reduces to the transmission loss of the better of the two panels plus a small amount, right, plus 3 dB or so. So it's kind of crucial uh, to provide the sound absorption in the space between the panels if you're going to realize the full uh, potential benefit. Uh, back to coincidence for a moment, you're still building this double panel out of flexurally stiff panels, and each one of those panels has a coincidence frequency itself, or a critical frequency, so that you can still get this coincidence dip, um, which is particularly bad when the two panels are identical, right? Because if both panels are becoming transparent at once, then the performance of the double panel uh, system disappears. So um, ideally, you want the two panels to be different. Uh, in a glass situation, you might want, I'm making up a number here, but like six millimeters of glass on one face and three millimeters on the other. And that might be a good combination to avoid a coincidence dip on both panels at the same time. So the overall behavior of double panel systems uh, is sketched here, where the single panel behavior might be like this, mass law down into a coincidence dip, and then up into a stiffness controlled region, whereas two, uh, two panels having the same, or sorry, if we split that into uh, a double panel system, the performance would look sort of like this, where there's the mass air mass resonance at low frequencies going into a high performance region with potentially a coincidence dip uh, up here, right? But if the airspace is filled with absorbing material, you get really startlingly good performance out of quite thin uh, treatments all the way up at high frequencies. I've, down here, I've left off the region where, again, it could bounce back up uh, into high uh, transmission loss regions if the panel's finite and if it's held around the edges. Now, uh, there are <laughs> a few that are, th there are some practical problems here. Um, uh, in the sense that if, um, certainly in an aircraft setting, um, so ideally, you don't want any mechanical connections between the two panels, right? As shown here, if you've got a direct mechanical connection between the two panels, then if you shake the first panel, the second panel is going to shake just from a purely mechanical point of view. So you short circuit the airspace, right? Uh, and so the performance of a double panel system can be ruined by simply a direct mechanical connection between the two faces. So that um, is a kind of obvious problem in an aircraft situation where, the, uh, where you've got the outer fuselage and you've got the trim panel inside. 
and you would like those two things to be independent of each other, but of course, <laughs> right, the only place you can attach the trim is to the fuselage, right? So uh, under situations like that, then you need to ensure that the connection is very resilient, right? Run a, use vibration isolators to try to minimize the vibration transmission uh, from one thing to another. Certainly in housing construction, this is sometimes an issue where you have uh, two sheets of construction material that are supported by the same piece of wood inside. So if you nail uh, sheets onto a piece of wood in America called joists, I'm not quite sure what the terminology would be here, but um, that has the same effect of short-circuiting the airspace between the panels and again sort of completely ruins the performance of the panel. So you have to use a little bit of intelligence to avoid that bridging effect. Um, uh, just a few words here about compliantly supported panels. I've said that uh, at low frequencies, the transmission loss can go up because of support around the edges. Uh, you can sometimes take advantage of the support, uh, as in this car window example, <coughs> excuse me, where uh, the rectangular plate, which is the window, uh, is held in resilient rubber um, uh, supports, so window sealing systems uh, that can act as vibration dampers for the uh, transverse motion of the panel and some, sometimes can be uh, kind of effective at improving transmission loss both at low and high frequencies because of the damping they provide. Uh, so, dissipation of vibration energy at the boundaries. Dissipation of the plate itself is usually negligible, but tuning of the stiffness of supports uh, can be helpful uh, with both forced vibration response and radiated sound, as it says here. So, that's... Um, what I want to say uh, for the moment about the performance of single and double barriers, just a few words about how people uh, rate uh, things. In engineering, people often want to have single numbers for things, right? If, you know, the sound transmission through a wall is fairly complicated, but nonetheless, you know, give me a number, right? Uh, give, <laughs> give me a number. So, uh, various uh, various countries have different words for this, but uh, in the U.S. there's the sound transmission class STC, uh, which is something which is a number, a single number that's derived by uh, fitting a standard curve, which is this thing that's got straight segments here, uh, to a measured transmission loss in such a way that you minimize the difference between the standard curve and the transmission loss. And then wherever the standard curve ends up at 500 hertz, that number is your sound transmission class for the barrier. And so you'd like a sound transmission class of, say, 40 decibels or something to uh, be a good barrier. Strictly speaking, what you have to do is measure the transmission loss in third octave bands, fit the standard curve so that no measured point is more than eight decibels below the standard curve and the total deficiency is no more than 32 dB. And then the sound transmission class is the value of the standard fitted curve at 500 hertz. And this makes certain assumptions about what the nature of the incident sound is and the behavior of the panels and things. Uh, so it's kind of good for speech and um, so on and so forth. Um, speaking, of, speaking of speech, maybe... Um, uh, uh, so maybe the double, you know, double sheetrock or double gypsum board uh, construction is maybe not so common here, I think, as it is in the U.S. Uh, here there's a lot of masonry construction. Uh, I think, but um, uh, in the U.S. there's a lot of uh, relatively lightweight uh, double gypsum board uh, constructions in apartment buildings and things. Uh, 
Um, and, some, and the performance can be reasonably good, but often is not so great. But uh, the, the point I'm coming up to has to do with speech here. Um, uh, speech uh, has two important components to it, as you maybe know. Uh, there's so-called voiced speech, which are the vowel sounds that you can make A, E, I, O, U. Uh, these are fairly high energy, uh, low frequency, tonal uh, kind of things. Uh, whereas the non-voiced speech is the, uh, in English, the sort of T's, D's, uh, things that mark the transition from one syllable to another, right? So uh, speech consists of various syllables uh, that involve both voiced speech, the vowel sounds, and then the unvoiced, which are, is typically forming the divisions between the vowels. <coughs> and so if you're going to understand speech, uh, you have to have both of those components. Uh, now, the unvoiced speech, which are the consonants uh, in English, uh, are the very low energy, high frequency uh, things. So if you run the speech through a low pass filter, uh, it's kind of interesting because you, uh, you can get rid of the uh, unvoiced stuff, uh, but you leave behind all of the vowel sounds. But what's interesting when you hear this kind of stuff is that you can absolutely tell it's speech, but you absolutely cannot understand what's being said because you've lost all of the information that divides one syllable from another and so on and so forth. So it's kind of interesting effect, I think. How does this connect with walls, right? Uh, so the uh, transmission loss of walls is generally kind of good at higher frequencies, but not so good at low frequencies. <coughs> so when you have noisy neighbors having a conversation in the next room, uh, you can often hear the low frequency stuff, which is the unvoiced or is the voiced speech, the vowel sounds. But of course, the wall is preventing the transmission from the of the uh, high frequency unvoiced component. So you can tell the people in the next room are having an argument, but you cannot tell what they're saying, right? And so that's irritating and frustrating, right? <laughs> so so uh, it would be nice if it were the other way around, so that you could actually, without having to put your ear against the wall. But anyway. So you'll remember that. Anyway, so the uh, transmission loss, which I've been talking about here, is a property of a wall itself. Right? <coughs> so it's kind of fundamental, fundamental performance property uh, of the wall. But it's uh, often not the thing that we're actually interested in from a design point of view in a room acoustic situation, because we um, are perhaps more interested in what the level difference is between a room where there's a noise source and a room where you're sitting trying to work, right? So we don't, in a sense, care what the transmission loss is. We want to know what the difference in sound pressure level is between those two spaces. And we want, in particular, to make sure that the sound pressure in room two is sufficiently low that we can do whatever we want to do in that space. So that uh, difference in sound pressure levels is something called the noise reduction of the wall, which is not just a phrase, but it has a technical meaning here, uh, precisely the difference in sound pressure levels between the two rooms. And I think you can understand that the, um, the sound pressure level in this room depends, of course, on how much sound energy is coming through the wall, but also on whether or not there's absorption in this space or whether the room is very reverberant or whatever. So the properties of this uh, receiving room are important in determining the sound pressure level in region two. Uh, and so the sort of standard result here is that the sound pressure level in room two is equal to the sound pressure level in room one minus the transmission loss, right? Uh, 
but then plus a term uh, that has to do with the area of the wall and uh, something called the room constant here, which has to do with the sound absorption uh, offered by the surfaces and things in the, in the uh, second room. So you have to be conscious of the fact that even if you design a very good barrier, sometimes it's not so good from a noise reduction point of view if the receiving room is kind of difficult, quote unquote, if you're, if you're trying to prevent sound transmission into a very reverberant space, uh, then maybe that gets difficult. The other uh, thing, of course, is that um, it's unusual to have a, um, a wall in a construction where there's just one thing, right? It's, uh, it's usually, uh, say, in the front of a house or of a building or something, there are various kinds of structures. There are windows, there's wall, door, uh, s ventilation systems and things. So that there's no single component <coughs> transmitting through uh, from the front to the interior space. So um, you, the, what's usually done in that case is to, let's say, break it up into appropriate areas and then consider the area of each one of those elements as well as the transmission coefficient of those individual elements and then do this uh, so-called area weighted average of the transmission coefficients of the individual components to get a, an average transmission coefficient for the complete system, right? And then turn that into a transmission loss. Uh, and one thing that we can point out here, which is a very important, you know, if you take nothing else away from this discussion, you should remember things like the mass law, the coincidence effect, mass air, mass resonance, but also this very crucial uh, thing here. If you've got a reasonably good wall, the transmission coefficient is like 0 0.001, right? But if you've got an opening going right through the wall, the transmission coefficient of that hole is one, right? Which is a thousand <laughs> times bigger than a reasonably good barrier, right? So if you've got a tenth of a square meter, well, maybe not a tenth, but what some fraction of a square meter uh, open area that you have to multiply, you multiply that area by a thousand, right? And then that's equivalent to the same area of the rest. So it's kind of um, really damaging uh, to have an open area uh, as one of these terms here. So an open area has the effect of a wall area that's a thousand times as large. Uh, so the wall performance can be completely ruined by air gaps uh, that are around, typically around doors uh, through or through ventilators and so on and so forth. And if, of course, windows are an obvious example. If a window is closed, then you may get good sound transmission performance. But of course, if you open it, right, uh, the transmission loss performance disappears. Uh, and that is a very kind of typical issue around airports where, of course, sometimes the airport operators offer remediation programs to improve uh, the windows in housing, right, to bring the transmission loss up to, or the barrier performance up to a certain level. But of course, oddly enough, people want to breathe, right? <laughs> and so. Uh, it becomes complicated to get good transmission loss as well as natural ventilation in spaces, and that's still a little bit of a challenge. But uh, in, in engineering cases, you have to be aware of the fact that a hole is really bad from a sound transmission point of view. One, I'll quit in just one more slide, I think, but... Um, the other place where this is really an issue is in automotive systems uh, on dash panels. Uh, 
uh, the structure separating the interior of the vehicle from the engine compartment because you've got a lot of stuff uh, going through the dash panel. Uh, there's vent HVAC, ventilation stuff, uh, various wiring systems, uh, controls and things. Uh, and so those are typically passing through rubber grommet systems. But if those are not installed properly, then that can be, again, really damaging uh, from the sound transmission point of view. Uh, as can, um, a sort of example of that is uh, something referred to as flanking transmission, where you maybe build a high performance barrier, but then there's a path for sound to travel around uh, the barrier. And the typical guilty party in that case is our ventilation system, where the duct work uh, in the ceiling may or may not connect directly to the duct work in the adjacent room, in which case, however good the wall performance is, if sound can simply transmit through the HVAC duct, then that's, uh, of course, bridging the wall and, and killing your performance. Uh, so you need to be a little bit conscious of that, in, particularly, in particular with suspended acoustic ceilings, uh, which where the wall may just go up to the ceiling height, and then there's space above that where sound can sometimes transmit over the top. But anyway, I was, am running a little bit late, so I will give up. <laughs> I will give up at that point, um, and we can have our break. And then I guess in a half an hour, we're back with acoustic sources. Okay. So does anybody have any questions about them? Sure. After the after the break, I may maybe lower that a little bit. Um, always dangerous to do the lecture before lunch, or right? standing between you and food <laughs> is not not such a great idea. And I I hope you appreciate our our <laughs> the the wonderful new Herrick Labs logo. An unbelievable amount of effort went into designing this, right? So anyway, we're we're trying to keep up with modern times by branding ourselves. But anyway, <coughs> so uh, in this lecture, I'd like to uh, do a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, talk about some simple source models that are used to represent uh, specific physical source mechanisms. And so it's kind of useful from a physical point of view to understand how these things work, but also they can then be used to model the sound radiation from real sources if you know what the source type is. And associated with the source models, there's uh, directionality effects, so things radiate in particular directions, as well as radiation efficiency, which you can think of as the efficiency with which motion, source motion, is turned into sound. And some um, some noise control can be done, in a sense, by uh, reducing the radiation efficiency of a structure uh, if you understand what the source mechanisms are like. And then, um, uh, depending on time, uh, some uh, talk about sound radiation, uh, not from compact or small sources, but from big sources like panels. But anyway, fundamentally, uh, a source 
uh, is a fluctuating mechanism giving rise to propagating disturbance in the, el in the elastic medium. So that's <coughs> something is vibrating back and forth and creating, mo creating motion, which then <laughs> propagates away as sound. Um, just in passing here, um, if I move my hand back and forth here, how does, how does, well, anyway, what, what's happening to the fluid as I move? Uh, well, yeah, so if I, if I move my hand very slowly, uh, then if I move this way, it's simply displacing air around, right? And it's not doing, and it's not compressing anything because the velocity is so low, right? But if I, you know, if if I could move my hand at a thousand hertz, right? Uh, then, w in effect, what's happening is that uh, at very low frequencies, the air can move without compressing and simply goes around the object that's moving. But at much higher frequencies, the air cannot get out of the way fast enough, right? And so the impact is that the fluid, instead of displacing over the moving, uh, moving surface, is compressed. And as soon as the fluid is compressed, that's when it begins to radiate away as sound, right? So... Uh, this idea that a vibrating object generates sound, uh, there's also kind of an implicit assumption that it's moving fast enough or at a high enough frequency so that you're generating significant compression of the fluid close to the uh, object. Uh, and I should say as well, of course, that uh, this is a vibrating solid object, but of course fluid flows which have nothing to do with solids, can also generate sound, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So the sound field is the resulting disturbance in the medium and is described by the sound pressure field. And <coughs> if, this, if the acoustic source is something that we can characterize in a simple mathematical form, then we can use that model to predict what the sound field is going to be like every, you know, everywhere in space. Um, and conversely, if uh, we measure the sound field, then we can perhaps tell something about what the source is, and that's maybe important from a diagnostic point of view. So there are, let's say, two sides to this picture. One where if we, if we want to understand how sound propagates through space, we have to know what the source model is. Uh, if we want to investigate a particular source, maybe we look at the sound field and infer what the type of source is uh, from that. So uh, yesterday we were talking about things like sound pressure intensity to, uh, and various other things. Uh, these are characteristics of the sound field, but uh, not necessarily uh, have anything to do with how the sound is generated. But here, uh, we would like to talk about the physical mechanisms that give rise to sound <coughs> and set the fluid particles into fluctuating motion. And so typically, the types of source mechanisms that are available to us are listed here. Uh, so there's the oscillating mass of flow, or oscillating flow of mass, I think that should be, into the fluid. Uh, and that is referring to something that, let's say, expands and contracts, right? So it moves fluid away and then sucks it back. And, uh, and that is the most efficient possible uh, source mechanism where you're m physically moving fluid away and then pulling it back. Uh, then the second type of source is the one that I was trying to illustrate with my hand, where you're applying a fluctuating force to the fluid. So we're not actually creating a volume change, but we're trying to force fluid back and forth by using a piston or some other vibrating structuring. Uh, and then 
uh, I was talking about sound generation by flow is this application of fluctuating moments <coughs> to, is characteristic of turbulence, right? Where you have vortices that are rolling up and interacting with each other uh, to create shear stresses or stresses in the fluid, which then generate sound, right? And then uh, application of fluctuating <laughs> squeezing action, that has to do with uh, something called longitudinal quadrupoles that we will get to in a moment. So there's actually something uh, missing uh, from this list, which is maybe a subject of interest to folks at the moment. Do you have any clue what that would be? So this all has to do with mechanical motion, but there's... Uh, well, the fluid do stuff is maybe uh, arguably that, but we're sort of ignoring thermodynamics here because there is the possibility of oscillatory heat flow, which changes the density of fluid uh, close to a heating element. And if you can change the temperature very rapidly, uh, then you can uh, generate sound that way. And if you, if you do a Google search for... A, uh, <laughs> CNT is a little bit of a buzzword at the moment, carbon nanotube loudspeakers, right, where uh, a very thin element that is used to generate a fluctuating heat uh, source at the surface, and these things can generate sound and act like loudspeakers even though nothing moves. So <coughs> we should probably add that to this list of, uh, of potential source mechanisms. But let's get back to the basics at the moment. So the uh, simplest possible uh, acoustic source is this monopole, uh, which is as small, you can picture as a small pulsating sphere uh, that moves in and out with, in the harmonic world, with a surface velocity that's sinusoidal. And as I say, this is conceptualized as adding mass to the region and then subtracting it, <coughs> excuse me, so the sphere expands, mass is added, it contracts, mass is subtracted. So if you were to draw sort of conceptually a little sphere around the expanding and contracting object, fluid is forced out and then fluid is sucked back, right? So this is the idea of oscillatory mass flow generating motion. <coughs> excuse me, generating motion and then sound. Uh, and this is particularly effective because there's nowhere for this flow to go except out, right? You cannot, <laughs> there's no escape since everything is moving out at the same time. It can't move sideways, it has to move out. And that's very effective at compressing uh, sound, or sorry, compressing the fluid and so generating sound. Uh, so this is a very good model uh, for any compact source where, there's, where there is this periodic addition and subtraction of mass, which is like the open end of an organ pipe, for example. Um, or a classic example is a baffled loudspeaker. Um, and I don't know if everyone is familiar with the term baffle here, which uh, in common English, of course, means to confuse, but, um, but here refers to a plane surface of some kind with the sound source embedded in the surface, right? And so you've got this large baffle, quote unquote, a hard surface with the source mounted in it, right? So if a loudspeaker were simply uh, placed against the wall that would be referred to as a baffled loudspeaker. And that is uh, when the wavelength is large compared to the size of the loudspeaker, that can be modeled actually pretty accurately as a monopole. But the, uh, to get away with a model like this, the source regions need to be, needs to be small compared to the wavelength uh, of sound. We're talking about so-called compact uh, sources at this point. Uh, if you put 
uh, two monopoles close to each other, then you generate uh, this thing called the dipole, uh, where one of the monopoles is, let's say, positively phased, the other is negatively phased, which means that this one is expanding while this one is contracting, and then this one expands while this one contracts, right? And I think um, you can probably imagine more or less easily that this one is sucking in essentially all the mass that this one is forcing out, right? <coughs> so that if you draw again this sphere that encloses now the two monopoles, one acting out of phase with the other, there's no net flow of mass across that sphere. But what is happening is that fluid is moving from here to there and then back again, right? So the action of putting two out-of-phase out monopoles close to each other is to accelerate fluid back and forth uh, at a point in a particular direction. And that is equivalent to applying a force to a, f uh, to a, a little lump of fluid at a point in space. So while the, uh, while the monopole is a good uh, model for anything where there is an expansion and contraction, the dipole is a good model for a source where nothing is physically expanding and contracting, but an object is moving, right? So this example of my hand moving back and forth, I'm applying a force to the fluid, and if I, if I, if I could move my hand fast enough to generate sound here, we would, uh, we would be able to model the sound radiation from this as a dipole. And what, um, uh, I don't know what your experience with loudspeakers is, but you can often buy uh, component loudspeakers, you know, forgetting about enclosures and stuff, where the loudspeaker, the diaphragm, is supported by a metal structure. And of course, you could see the diaphragm from the front, but the web is open at the back, so you can see the back of the diaphragm as well. And so that's a quote unquote unbaffled loudspeaker, <coughs> which simply moves fluid back and forth in space. So a dipole is an excellent representation of an unbaffled loudspeaker. You can do very close fits, uh, again, if the source is small compared to a wavelength. So the important thing about the dipole is that it can be used to represent a force that's applied to a fluid uh, and where there's no net mass flow uh, as a result of the fluid motion. The other uh, thing where this is significant, if you have a jet of fluid impinging on a solid surface, of course the air deflects, right? And the solid, in effect, applies a force uh, to the fluid, <coughs> and that interaction of the fluid and uh, solid uh, can again be modeled as a dipole system because the, uh, the uh, force is being applied uh, to the fluid. So um, this is just continuing the dipole here. The fluid is accelerated back and forth as if an, oscill as an oscillatory force were applied to the fluid. Uh, so the dipole is used to model sources which apply forces to a fluid and uh, unbaffled loudspeaker I've mentioned, uh, but fan blades, uh, in particular axial fan blades uh, of the type that's on the back plane of your desktop computer or something, so an 80 millimeter or 120 millimeter axial fan, uh, the sound radiation from one of those things is also classic uh, dipole, if you take a look at the radiation pattern. Uh, continuing, <laughs> we'll only go so far with these series, but you can, you can keep adding monopoles. And if you add a second dipole to the first, <coughs> so maybe this is the first dipole, now we put uh, a second dipole beside it uh, so that, well, this one's negative, this one's positive, this one's negative, this is positive. So this is uh, expanding, this is contracting, 
this is expanding, this is contracting. Uh, and you can sort of imagine that this is creating a rotation of fluid because while this flow down here, the flow is going in this direction, while at this, that up here, the flow is going in this direction. And then, of course, they both reverse. But it's like creating a shearing motion um, by, back and forth. Uh, in the fluid. So also the fact that this one's applying a force in this direction, this one's applying a force in this direction, means that there's no net force that's being applied to the fluid, but there is a moment that's being applied to the fluid. So this, uh, the quadrupole is used classically to represent any kind of source mechanism which results from rotational events uh, in the fluid. And this is why it's used to uh, represent uh, sound generation by turbulent vortices interacting in flow, right? And this was <coughs> kind of the original observation of um, uh, Sir James Lighthill, if you recognize that name, maybe arguably the most famous acoustics paper of the 20th century. His uh, a uh, paper on sound generation by homogeneous turbulence, uh, where he introduced the idea that you could model sound generation uh, from turbulent flows by using quadruple uh, expansions. Sir James Lighthill, an odd character, right? Um, a little story here. He's a very, very, very famous. I don't know if you know him, a great applied mathematician. My PhD advisor thought that he was the greatest applied mathematician <coughs> of the last century. Uh, but he had a big interest in fluid mechanics uh, as opposed to uh, sort of classical mechanics as opposed to quantum physics or something. Uh, <laughs> the theory there, he was at Winchester Boys School in the same class as Freeman Dyson who went on to, who was the only person I think James felt threatened by. <coughs> so Freeman Dyson went on to do a quantum electrodynamics, and so James did uh, classical mechanics, I think. But um, his interest in fluid mechanics ultimately did him in, oddly enough, because his hobby was swimming around islands, <laughs> right? <laughs> Because he, he uh, thought that he could figure out where the currents were and so swim along with the currents. <coughs> and so he'd actually he'd swim around islands the, in the English Channel and stuff like this. So uh, finally, he <laughs> died of a heart attack in, when, at the age of 72 while swimming around the island of Sark in the English Channel. So you should, you should not be too ambitious. Maybe even beyond beyond a point, but but Sir James was very uh, powerful in mathem mathematical representation, and as I say, came up with the idea of using multiple expansions to uh, represent acoustic sources. So the quadrupole, this lat so-called lateral quadrupole, is very uh, good way of representing turbulent uh, noise generation, jet mixing noise, for example. So in all of these uh, things, they're simple theoretical models, right? Here it describes as mathematical abstractions uh, that have very well prescribed uh, mathematical properties. And if your source mechanism actually matches with one of these things, it's a very powerful tool because you can use a relatively simple model to uh, predict the sound field in various uh, contexts, right? So um, again, I sort of, sort of climb on my soapbox here, but the, uh, the thing that makes you sort of an acoustician or a, an expert, quote unquote, maybe sometimes, is that you can do things very simply whereas other people are maybe using 128 core parallel processing, computational fluid dynamics uh, in conjunction with boundary element programs to, you know, that run for a week to do a sound radiation prediction. If you, if you make appropriate decisions or if you understand what the physics of a model is, 
uh, then it may be possible for you to just write the solution down and get on with it. So that's, <coughs> I'll stop with the editorializing here. But um, anybody can do it. Anyway, uh, so simple models that can then be super, uh, superposed to represent extended sources uh, when we don't have something that's just super compact, but something that extends over space. Now, so each one of those little models represents a certain type of physical source mechanism, volume change, force application, shearing, and stuff. Uh, and from an observational point of view, they are distinguished by having different sound radiation properties. And we'll talk about uh, directionality first. So uh, the sound pressure, you can imagine at point P here, uh, is a combination of the sound radiated from all points on the surface of this little expanding and contracting thing, right? Uh, and so sound arrives from point B, sound arrives from point A, <coughs> so on and so forth. So if, if, those, if the sound arriving from those two points is in phase, then they add up and create positive, inter positive interference. If, they are as, if the phase difference is significant, they may interfere with each other and partially cancel each other. But if the source is very small compared to a wavelength, the path length difference between all these points is kind of small, so they always add up, regardless of which direction you are with respect to the source. So the, this interaction of sound is known as interference. If the path length difference between B and P and A and P were half a wavelength, the two signals would be 180 degrees out of phase with each other and they would cancel, right? But if the source is very small for a monopole, if the wavelength is big compared to the radius of the source, and if you're a long way from the source where this is the radius A, I guess it probably doesn't say that anywhere, but the radius A of the little spherical source. So if these conditions are true, then interference is negligible, and the contours of equal pressure are spheres around the source. So you get this perfectly uniform uh, radiation from a monopole that is non-directional. Right? So, so an attribute of something that's compact and creates volume changes is that it radiates sound uniformly in all directions. Okay, so that's not now true of a dipole because if we have our two monopoles side by side, this one positive, this one negative, then uh, it's kind of obvious that everywhere on this line, the signal arriving from this source and the signal arriving from this source are exactly out of phase with each other, right? So everywhere along this line, the cancellation occurs, right? So uh, if you looked at the dipole from the side, you cannot hear anything coming in this direction. Whereas if we're out here, there is a path length difference between the sound coming from here and from here, so even though they're running out of phase, the cancellation is not quite perfect. So we still get sound coming out in this direction and out in this direction, but not in this direction. And again, this is something I said that uh, you can uh, use a dipole model to represent an unbaffled loudspeaker and you can run a pretty simple experiment just running a unbaffled loudspeaker with a single tone uh, and change the orientation, right? And if you hold it so that the diaphragm is moving back and forth in this direction, it should be very quiet compared to turning it around to face you where the, uh, then you're in the area of the main radiation. So the net result of this is that you get a figure of eight directivity pattern, uh, again, if these various compact source conditions are met. 
And this is a kind of classic figure um, relating to, uh, sort of summarizing the behavior of monopoles, dipoles, lateral quadrupoles, and longitudinal quadrupoles, where you put two dipoles end to end uh, like this. <coughs> uh, so, and this is uh, the sort of fluctuating piston model for what's going on. Uh, and then the directivity patterns that are associated with uh, these things. So uniform radiation for a monopole, figure of eight for a dipole, and then this, um, someone's going to have to tell me what this shape is, the four-leaf clover. Yes. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, four lobes uh, here. And then the uh, longitudinal quadrupole, where you put the dipoles end to end, uh, is a, something that looks a bit like the dipole, but we'll see that the radiation efficiency uh, is low. Um, <coughs> and in particular, let's uh, talk about the radiation efficiency. Well, actually, let's stop just for a sec. Um, uh, a dipole represents a force that is applied to uh, an object. So uh, has, has anyone here ever played pool, <laughs> right? Or snooker or billiards or anything where, the, where you play with balls that collide with each other? Uh, you know, there's, you know <laughs> when you make a nice hit, uh, there's a sort of satisfying click as the balls interact with each other and go off in different directions. And the question is, uh, if you had to choose amongst these source mechanisms, what's making the click? And this is... Uh, well, uh, that's getting close, right? Uh, because what, what people often think is that the, when the balls run into each other, it excites modes of vibration of the balls. <coughs> but if you actually take a look at the natural frequencies uh, for those things, they're, they're ultrasonic, right? So as far as we're concerned, they're totally solid and um, undeformable in the frequency range that we're concerned with. So when they do run into each other, they apply, they of course uh, are head off in different directions because of the force, the force interaction between the two. So there's a force applied to each of the balls as a result of the interaction. So each one of the balls is acting like a dipole. And so the net result actually is that they're more like a longitudinal quadrupole, right? Uh, and so, <laughs> speaking with the B and K gentleman about arrays of microphones, it would be, I'll, I'll give you this one, it would be interesting to uh, stick an array of microphones over a pool table <laughs> and see what the directivity of the source was actually like. So you can, you can do that in your spare time. <laughs> So the other uh, very important, so each one of these source mechanisms has a different um, directivity pattern, uh, but also the thing referred to as the radiation efficiency is way different for each of the source mechanisms. Uh, the, uh, the monopole, if you do, um, if you start doing a little bit of theory here, uh, the so-called volume source strength has to do with the amount of fluid that's being displaced per second by the motion of the source, and that's this Q here, the area of the sphere times the velocity of the surface. Uh, and if you know what that is, you can work out what the intensity is as a function of all these parameters, mostly frequency here. You can work out the sound power uh, and as noted here, the sound power is proportional to k squared. Remember, this is the wave number, which is omega over c. So this is uh, sound power is proportional to frequency squared if the volume source strength is independent of frequency. So you can do the same thing with uh, 
two monopoles, stick them together and do the dipole uh, case, uh, where now the source strength is the volume source strength of the individual monopole multiplied by the distance between them. As the distance gets larger, the interference effects become more significant, and so the source strength goes up. But again, you can work, there's a complicated expression here, but you can work out what the intensity is in the sound power. And why I want to do that is to take a look at the sound power radiated by the dipole compared to the sound power radiated by the monopole and define that as this radiation efficiency. And that ends up being this parameter here, this k squared L squared. Uh, where k is the wave number, l is the space between uh, the two uh, monopoles. And typically that number is <coughs> a lot less than one, right? Because the source, the source are very close together. And so what that means is that the dipole is radiating a lot less sound power than the monopole, right? So uh, this... Uh, and you can again prove that to yourself if with the unbaffled loudspeaker example. If you take an unbaffled loudspeaker, run it at a certain voltage, uh, and notice what the sound pressure is like, and then mount it in a big sheet of wood, put the wood against a wall or something, and run the loudspeaker, you'll see it's much more efficient at turning voltage into sound, right? So the radiation efficiency of uh, a dipole is a lot less than a monopole. And if you do the same thing with uh, the quadrupole, you'll find that uh, the sound power of the uh, monopole, uh, sorry, the, of the <coughs> uh, lateral quadrupole is this. And again, the radiation efficiency, W lat, over the sound power of the monopole is a very small number. And the radiation efficiency of the quadrupole is a lot less than the radiation efficiency of a dipole, which is a lot less than one. So as these sources become more complicated, there's more internal cancellation going on, and there's not a very efficient translation of source motion into sound, uh, sound power. This is um, a, sort of actually of particular technical significance when you're doing uh, computational fluid dynamics and trying to predict uh, sound radiation from turbulent flows, for example, uh, because the source mechanism is so inefficient compared to the fluid motion that the acoustic stuff is sort of like five orders of magnitude down uh, compared with the fluid dynamics forces that are involved. Uh, and so the uh, accuracy of a numerical solver has to be extremely good uh, to capture the, accurately the sound radiation from turbulence in a numerical context. But the other uh, significance of that maybe is that if you uh, if you have a source that's a monopole, uh, then one way to reduce the sound radiation from the monopole is to put, of course, a second monopole beside it and simply run it out of phase. And this is the basis of a certain number of active noise control uh, solutions, particularly with exhaust pipes, right? Because the end, the opening of an exhaust pipe acts like a monopole source. If you simply put a baffled loudspeaker beside it and run it out of phase with the uh, signal coming out of the exhaust pipe, then you can turn the original monopole into a dipole and so reduce the radiated sound power pretty dramatically. Uh, and the original active noise control systems for automotive exhaust systems were operated along these lines. Um, with it, I, we, I, in conjunction with some people at Sony, have a patent on uh, something that's a little arguably similar to that. If you have a, an axial fan uh, on the back plane of a computer, 
uh, that is actually radiating like a monopole because you just see one side of the fan, right? Um, <laughs> this sounds too simple to be true, but if you, if you then <laughs> cut a hole in the box, right, so that you expose the back of the fan and put something like mylar uh, that prevents air moving through but allows sound to transmit, uh, you can turn the monopole radiation into a dipole and the sound radiation goes way down, right? So it seems sort of like cheating. If you cut a hole in the box, it gets quieter. But that is, uh, that is simply converting a monopole source into a dipole source for the purpose of controlling the sound. And so you can do the same sort of thing uh, where you go up <coughs> uh, in, mono in multipole order. Okay, so let me now say a few things about uh, near and far field characteristics. Um, we talked yesterday about plane waves, uh, where the acoustic pressure and particle velocities are in phase with each other, freely propagating plane waves. Whereas if we've got non-plane waves, which are the type that are generated by these compact sources, uh, then the pressure and velocity are typically out of phase with each other, and there's some uh, more or less complicated relation between the two. Uh, for the, and one of the consequences is that for plane waves, there's a very simple relation between pressure and velocity, which is not true uh, for non-planar waves. And the field close to most sources is non-planar, Right, where the, the pressure and velocity are not in phase with each other. And that is one way of thinking about the near field, which is the sound, or the sound field close to the source. Uh, and as we were talking about yesterday, the behavior of the sound in that region can vary significantly from one point to another, so that it's hard to generalize from the sound pressure measured at one point to the sound pressure, for example. So we cannot necessarily make a measurement close to one of these sources and predict what's going to be happening <coughs> in the far field. So uh, just a little sort of made up example here where we have a machine of some sort like an engine. Uh, and if we make measurements as a function of position away from the source and look at the sound pressure level, Typically, what you see is a sort of bouncing around region as you move away from the source where things are going up and down. And then finally, there's a kind of tip over into uh, the far field, character, far field character here. And what's, a, what's happening in this region is that, again, because you're relatively close to the source, there are big path length differences between sound coming from here and sound coming from down here. So interference can cause a reduction of sound uh, quite close to the source, but which then picks up again as you go farther away. And as you move farther and farther and farther away, the path length differences from the various points on the machine get smaller and smaller and smaller, so that ultimately you end up with this kind of smooth character. right? And so if you're out here, you can sort of safely measure the pressure at some point and then extrapolate to more distant points. So the extent of the, how big the near field is is, of course, kind of complicated. Uh, it has to do with frequency, the size of the source. And if you've got a big source, if, if the different parts of the source are vibrating out of phase with each other, but if you had to maybe generalize, if you're a couple of wavelengths from the source, then maybe you're approaching a far field condition. But um, anyway, let's just keep going. The far in, in the far field region, uh, then if you've got spherical waves, one over R, 1 over square root of r for cylindrical constant for plane waves, right? as we were talking about yesterday. So very simple then dependence on distance and also uh, 
of sort of fixed relation between pressure and intensity. Um, if we also, so uh, uh, talking about maybe moving from the f near field to the far field, and then in the absence of any reflections, then we're in the free field, quote unquote. <coughs> so if our distance from the source is significantly bigger than a wavelength, and also the size of the source is significantly less than a wavelength, then we can sort of guarantee that we're in the far field of a source. Uh, but uh, for a finite source, we want to make sure that the wavelength is bigger. I think this is the wrong way around, to be honest, that the uh, wavelength should be bigger than the size of the object, right? And then we can guarantee that as we move away from the source, it's going to act like a compact source. And let me maybe speed up just a little bit here, uh, because I would like to talk uh, towards the end here about sound radiation from panels. So everything we've talked about so far applied to, let's say, mostly compact sources. <coughs> but a lot of sources are not compact, right? So the floor pan on an automobile, uh, windows, da -da 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 -da, lots of things have kind of significant spatial extent. Uh, and so we should maybe pay a little bit of attention to how these things radiate sound. In particular, uh, let's think about infinite panels at the moment. Uh, and these things mostly vibrate in a flexural way, where the motion of the panel as it vibrates is transverse to the direction of wave propagation. So transverse waves uh, propagating along in the panel. Uh, and something that is true in air is that we talked about yesterday, the speed of sound uh, in air is not a function of frequency, right? So at 100 hertz, the speed is 340 meters per second. At 1,000 hertz, it's 340 meters, da 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 da, da. So uh, the speed of sound is constant as a function, or not a function of frequency, but a uh, flexural wave motion on a plate, the speed of wave propagation is a function of frequency. Uh, and in particular, sorry, this is the fourth root here. So the bending wave speed is proportional to omega to the one half. That is, the bending wave speed gets faster and faster and faster as the frequency goes up. And this has very important implications as far as sound radiation goes because here is a plot of the bending wave speed in a plate. So we're imagining we've got a big plate. There, there's some force being applied to the plate that causes flexural wave motion, right? And for a given plate, the speed of wave propagation goes up like this. And if you increase the stiffness of the plate, it goes faster and faster and faster, right? Now, the speed of sound in air is a constant. And so it would be a horizontal line here. Uh, and um, where the two meet, we were talking about in the last lecture, that was actually the critical frequency Right, where the speed of sound in air is equal to the free flexural wave speed in the panel, that's the critical frequency. That's when you get perfect spatial matching uh, between the sound field and the free vibration of the plate. And if you pursue this a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, at any frequency above the critical frequency, it's possible for the flexural waves in the, in the plate to match perfectly with a radiating sound field heading off away from the plate. Whereas, this is maybe not immediately obvious, but if you're at a frequency below the critical frequency where the waves in the plate are traveling slower than the uh, sound in air at the same frequency, uh, 
then it's not possible to do this perfect matching of the trace wavelength. So in principle, from a mathematical point of view, uh, let's, we would say, maybe without justification here for the moment, that the below the critical frequency, sound cannot radiate from a uh, infinite panel due to flexural vibration. So if you're below the critical frequency, the plate is silent. But if you go above the critical frequency, the plate begins to radiate, right? So that there's a dramatic change in radiation efficiency as you go from below the critical frequency to above the critical frequency. And that is very important, again, from a kind of design point of view, uh, because if you've got panels as part of your machine structure, uh, you would like to design panels that do not radiate sound effectively, and so you'd want to have a kind of high critical frequency again uh, if you can manage it. Whereas putting carbon fiber composite sheets may be brilliant from a kind of structural point of view because they're light and stiff, uh, but they radiate like mad, right? Very effective radiators. <coughs> so something, so there have to be some compromises made in the design process. So the sound radiation thing, as I say, flexural motion of the panel, uh, this is the trace wavelength, and if you angle the sound over like this, you can match that trace wavelength with the sound radiating off in that direction. So each one of the waves propagating along the plate can radiate sound off in a certain direction, but you can only achieve this perfect matching at frequencies above the critical frequency. And so, let me see if I can just go to this curve, which shows the radiation efficiency. And this is the efficiency with which the transverse motion of the panel is turned into sound. Uh, and this is, in a sense, normalized with respect to the critical frequency. And what we find is that below the critical frequency, the radiation efficiency is poor reaches a peak at the critical frequency and then sort of goes down a bit, right? So uh, very important from a design point of view, and again emphasizes the fact that sort of good panel materials are, relevant, are not super stiff, right, and have high critical frequencies. And that, of course, is often a problem from a design point of view because, you know, your structural engineer wants to build everything <laughs> as stiff as possible and as light as possible. And, of course, from a noise control point of view, that is in exactly the wrong direction, right? So that's uh, where uh, some intelligence is required to try to come to a compromise uh, solution. The I'm maybe telling too many stories, but a, uh, a project that I was involved with was uh, with uh, uh, what was then Raytheon Aircraft, which is now Hawker Beechcraft. Uh, they have a very interesting biz jet, business jet, uh, the uh, Premier, uh, which is, I think, the first commercial aircraft that's made entirely of carbon fiber composites. Uh, so 20 millimeter thick uh, carbon fiber face sheets with a honeycomb core. This is different than the Boeing 787, for example, which is really um, built like an aluminum aircraft, but with plastic panels, if you know what I mean. So the structure of the 787 is still sort of conventional, even though it's even though it's made of plastic, right? Uh, but the uh, Premier is interesting because it's a real carbon fiber composite aircraft uh, and it's kind of brilliant from a structural point of view because you can basically spin the fuselage in one piece, right? So, uh, and it's very light and stiff and it's just kind of fantastic from a structural point of view. Uh, but 
but from an acoustic point of view, is like it is. Uh, I, you'll think I'm exaggerating here, but it is as bad as it can possibly be. Uh, so, um, because the critical frequency for the fuselage is like 100 hertz or something, right? Uh, so it's kind of ridiculous from a sound transmission point of view. So when they first built the aircraft, you know, these things are, it's an, actually, to be honest, it's a cheap business jet. You know, the next time you have $20 million to spend, you can buy one of these things. But even so, people were basically having to use earplugs, which is not the thing. If you spend $20 million on an aircraft, you don't expect to have to use earplugs. So, um, and the problem is simply this bit that the structure is very light, it's very stiff, the free wave propagation is very fast. And in particular, at high frequencies, the tone from the aft-mounted engines was going straight through the fuselage as if it wasn't there, right? Uh, so um, uh, we did a treatment for them, uh, which I'll talk about tomorrow, actually, but which added three kilograms to the aircraft and took 60 BA out of the interior, which was very successful, right? But again, it requires some uh, special physics. Uh, whereas dealing with aluminum structures or steel structures where the coincidence frequency is very high uh, makes your life kind of easier. Right? So it, it's, I would say, very important to understand some things like this uh, to make sure that you're choosing the appropriate treatment in a particular frequency range. I I think I will. Yeah, so the main message from this section is that big panels do not radiate sound effectively below the critical frequency. So being aware of that is kind of important. The next uh, section, which I think I'm going to say, there's a, a lecture, I think, tomorrow or Thursday on uh, procedures, pr principles of noise control. When is that one? Thursday morning. Thursday morning. So it, I think, is a relatively short one. And I think I will talk about sound radiation from finite panels, uh, maybe in the second part of that uh, thing, because there's another 10 slides or something here which is more than we have time for, given, these, given the state of the clock, I think. So I'll save that till that point. Also, I will point out that in the notes that you have in your booklet uh, uh, for this section, there's an interesting description of sound radiation from line sources, right, where you put together a whole bunch of monopoles, in a sense, in a line. Uh, and you can create very interesting directivity uh, patterns uh, by using sources like this, which are the basis of a lot of modern uh, loudspeaker systems uh, that use line arrays to create pretty directional sources so that you can cover an audience with sound more or less uniformly in big stadiums and th uh, things like that, big, big public address systems. So with that, I think I will quit. And if anybody has any questions about this, I would be happy to hear them. Anyway. So lead good, carbon fiber composites bad. <laughs> that's, that's the message. Good. People are interested in lunch. <laughs>